<clears throat> on a discharge, this gives my life history on the back, pretty much. Make a copy of that. We'll put that in the, in the folder. We'll make a copy useful. before we leave. But, so. Okay. Well, right. Mr. Payne, could you just tell me uh, when you were born and where you were born? What year? Yeah. 1920. And where were you born in? October 26, 1920. Where, where was that at? Oh. speak up. Oh, where, where were you born? Point Rock. Point Rock, yeah? Okay. Okay, so um, where, when and where did you hear about the bombing of Pearl Harbor? I was in boot camp, Paris Island, South Carolina. Okay, and uh, what branch of the service did you enter, and why did you enter the service? What branch? Yeah. Marine Corps. Why did you enter the Marine Corps? Well, that's something I wanted to do when I was a kid. <laughs> I think it was a challenge that I wondered if I could do it. I wanted to go in when I was 17, but at that time you had to be 21 unless you got your folks' signatures. My folks wouldn't sign for me. So I had to wait till I was 21. I was 21 on the 26th of October. I was in the Marine Corps on the 27th. Nice. And um, you went to basic training at Paris Island? Yeah. And uh, what did basic training teach you? while you were there? Troop and drill. What exactly is troop and drill? Marching and formations. And that's the main thing. Ed? You want to tell you that? A few maneuvers. We're supposed to go basic training. Mm. And then you go to uh, New River, North Carolina for the actual combat training. Mm. But the war started. And there was no choice of where you went or what you did. It was you and you and you and you and you, you, you. That's how it was done. They just pick you off and just. If you so want. I was picked. Uh, I sent to Dover, New Jersey for guard duty. And then uh, after Dover, New Jersey, they sent me to Brooklyn Navy Yard. And from Brooklyn Navy Yard, I was sent overseas to Guadalcanal. Right, well, right. That, by the way, that was the first invasion of World War II. That's the beginning of the wartime thing. I don't know if you... Yeah, we went over that on our class. Um, where did you complete your infantry training at again? Huh? Where did you complete your infantry training? Guadalcanal. <laughs> In I guess that's, that's sort of <laughs> kind of covered that one, okay. yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, what did it teach you? Huh? What did it teach your Guadalcanal or the infantry training you went through? Well, we didn't get training. We, uh, how do you put it? We learned by experience. There was no training, and Guadalcanal mm -hmm. was actually what combat. So that actually, we we didn't have infantry training, training. and all that. Yeah. Uh, that was water under the bridge because they didn't have time. They just sent people there. You end up in combat. What did, what did you learn from that experience at Guadalcanal? I mean, your very first combat. Learn to try to keep out of sight so you don't get shot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what weapons did you learn to use there? Well, I, uh, we, in boot camp stuff, the rifle and the pistol. Mm -hmm. That time was bayonet practice and so forth. I ended up as a sharpshooter, I think, as a rifleman, and expert as a bayonet man. <laughs> I didn't realize they gave gave for bayoneting that they actually gave. There was a expert marksman or whatever for bayoneting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I don't think they teach that anymore. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, what was your military specialty? Could you explain it, Ed? That was your just, it was just infantry, bud. You know, like you, some guys, you weren't a you, you, It wasn't like you were also um, an administrative type of guy. You were just pure infantry, right? It was just there. You had yeah. no other additional. I was end up squad leader in the infantry. I had 12 men under me in the, in the squad. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that makes a 13 man squad. <laughs> but that's the way it was broke down. Um, 
were there any, any memorable events or people during any part of your training? During the training? Yeah. No, not really. Okay. We just followed orders and this jungle and stuff. But we just advanced through the jungle and hope you didn't get shot. <laughs> That's a good idea. There's a, really there's <clears throat> no no heroes there if you want to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Everybody did their job and some people did certain things and they happened to be or there happened to be an officer or something mm -hmm. that present to see it happen. Mm -hmm. Some got the silver star, they got recommendations mm -hmm. for metal, but I never got those. Uh, just learn by experience, that's all. Okay. Um, what theaters of operation did you serve in? What theaters? Yeah. Southwest Pacific. Southwest Pacific? It was on the island of invasion on the island of uh, Guadalcanal, uh, New Guinea, uh, Cape Gloucester, New Britain, and Tullow. Four. And the invasion, you go in, I don't know if you've seen pictures probably, uh, some of those pictures you see are far-fetched, but to get off a big boat, and these little boats, you're the first one to land. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I remember on Tullow, we landed there, well, we was probably, the boat probably a thousand yards from the beach before, mm -hmm. as we got in, you know. Mm -hmm. As you're going, you could see that beach there was just nothing but smoke and dust. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, uh, well, they shell over your head, they had these <coughs> battleships. And, 16-inch shells, and as we're going toward the shore, you can hear them whistle over your head. <laughs> I said to a guy in a the boat there, I said, Jesus, I hope you don't get a short brown there because it will be SOL. Mm -hmm. But it was all time. As you got further, as you got closer to the beach, they quit the bombing and strafing and shelling. And then they, you make the landing. Mm -hmm. um, what, what unit were you in? during your uh, time in World War II? K Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. K Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. K-3-5. I really remember it. Um, <clears throat> when did you leave to go, uh, what's their dad? When did you, when you leave? number 11? When did you leave to go where? You may want to bypass some of those. All right. Um, what was the rank and position that you had what did I want? What rank and position did you have? What you were? What you were, sergeant? Oh, sergeant. Yeah. Sergeant and a squad leader, right? Huh? And a squad leader. Yeah. Okay. Um, what were your responsibilities as a squad leader? Well, you had to, if you're going along, get your squad and have certain areas when you're moving across certain areas where you could. Uh, to cover, you know, you'd have one squad, they'd be all lined up, you know, and, and they'd be pushing through. So as a squad leader, you had to do your best to move forward and protect your men and your squad. Okay. They used to, they, in a training, in a boot camp, they stress it, but it don't work. In combat, they say, you know, like a squad leader sits back and he directs his squad. Mm -hmm. You send a scout here and a rifleman here and a brownie automatic man over here and a, you know the but in combat it don't work that way. Squad leader goes first, they'll follow. Mm -hmm. But you, it's hard to send you up here and that one up there. It don't work in combat. Squad leader goes first and uh, if you go first, they all follow, you know. It's, it's training, that's what it is. But it's uh, by the book doesn't work because it's pretty hard to send a, one person, say, as a scout, to go up and check that area. Mm -hmm. Squad leader goes ahead and they, they all follow. There's no problem there. But, mm -hmm. And uh, rank uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, <clears throat> they were very 
far as rank meant an awful lot. Even if a guy had one stripe, you'd call him sir. <laughs> um, how many uh, Island Beach Langs did you take a part of during the campaign? Four. Four of them? And uh, how did you prepare for the landings, for like equipment and like mentality-wise? Well, they have board ships, they tell us where we're going to go and what beach we were supposed to be and mm -hmm. how there were some certain areas where we were supposed to land mm -hmm. and they had some information you know, from aerial photographs to where the, but that didn't always work. Sometimes it screwed up. I know we land on Peladu, we had a company supposed to be right beside us and they landed way down the beach, and here we're just alone there because uh, we had no communication between, supposed to be all as a unit, you know, and this, but we had nobody either side of us. We was all alone there. <laughs> um, how about, if I can follow, how about mentally, bud? What, what, how did you guys, I mean, how, how did you prepare yourself for that? What, what did you think about, you know, when, when those moments before you landed? What, what was running through your mind? Well, scared of that. <laughs> Is uh, something like that coming up? You just well, you're scared. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you're gonna make it to the beach, if you're gonna get hit, or mm -hmm. whatever. You know, and everything, every your life goes in front of you there. And uh, you have. Uh, oh, you hear this. Nowadays they talk about religion and all that stuff. You know, there's no atheists in the foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> I got something here. Where the heck are these? I'm going to show you. This is kind of interesting. People don't believe in God. Well, I'm, I'm not what you call a religious person, but there must be somebody up there. I, I think the way things happen. But here, here's something. I just thought it was quite interesting. I'm going to make a copy of that too, Ben. You can yeah. put that all in there. So. Where'd you get that from, bud? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That was given the, the author. We I don't know who wrote that or something, but that was given a, given to us. I think one time in a they had church services. I think that was pretty well attended. All these over. <laughs> he wasn't no church or anything. He'd be out in a, around a tree, and a minister or chaplain would be there and conduct the service. I, that was given to us in a, one of the services. Um, like during the landings, did you meet like any particularly heavy resistance from like the Japanese, or they just let you land and? Well, normal resistance. I was well, on Peleliu. We didn't have too much resistance in the beginning mm -hmm. because they, that was the trick of it. They let the first wave go ashore, and they would have it pinpointed where normally they'd get the second or the third wave, because usually on the third wave you would get the officers and colonels and so forth would be in that third wave. They let the first wave go in and then they pinpoint the second and third wave because that's where the higher fish was supposed to be. So on Peleliu we was quite lucky, we didn't get much resistance until we got back across the island. Because this island where we landed, we went right across it only about a half a mile or so. But by the airport, where a lot of jet planes were strafed and, you know, shot up. So uh, we're sitting on a beach after we went across the aisle, we come back. And there's like a knoll there. And there was a piece of pipe stuck out of the ground about yay high. And we was looking on the shore and we were looking out to the beach and said, holy Christ, look at those boats. You know, a lot of them are 
our boats were shot up and smoking and killed a lot, you know. The, while we're sitting there, right where we're sitting, where this pipe sticking out of the ground, he's looking over the beach, there's a big sod there, you know, right there. That whole thing comes right up. And uh, out comes one of those Jap uh, artillery pieces. It was a hydraulic thing. They'd raise that thing up, they'd fire, and they'd drop it back down. And if you looked at it, you'd never know what was there. So as we set up on top, we threw, uh, they had that cover up, we threw some hand grenade down in that hole, and the cover went down and never opened back up again. <laughs> so, but we, that must have just been an air vent. Uh, They're in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a squad leader, um, what responsibilities did you have during the landing? Did you have any special responsibilities during the landing? Well, you're leading the squad where, as it says, squad view. Mm. Make your choices. Uh, now, to tell you one thing, where's my brother? Thank you. Uh, there's a history behind that play. Where did I get it? What's here? here? You know what kind of a play that is? Oh, oh wow. It's an old. Hold, it, hold it, let me hold them. Hold that up, bud. Let me get a picture here. Let me zoom out a little bit. Oh my God. Picture. That's a jab flag. Uh, you see all these writing on here? Yeah. This belonged to uh, like a platoon or company. They mm -hmm. have the standard bear carrying the flag. Mm -hmm. So what happened, we. This is on New Britain. So we was on patrol after things. We was going towards a place they called Rabal. I don't know if you ever heard of it. That's supposed to be a stronghold. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of enemy ahead of us because uh, through the, oh, there must have been a trail two foot wide there where you could see hundreds of people were walking. And what they did, they had like delayed action. As we're getting kind of close, they fire burst a machine gun at us, and that would be it. What they're doing, and when they do that, it slows everything up. So we got a little close that happened off and on, you know, just to keep us behind them. So we got to this one river, and that's what I got the story about the flag. So we get to the river, and then meanwhile, our company commander was, the battalion and company commander was killed, and they sent in a, what we call 90 day one, or the second lieutenant, he just finished OCS school. Mm -hmm. So we got that river, and that river was probably, oh, 300 foot wide. So we get that river, and right at the end of the river, we killed five Japs there, right on the bank of the river, and it was raining and wet. And that was just about dark, you know. We were laying there, and we had to eat what they call poncho, but that didn't do any good. The ground was wet, and you, there was no such thing as a fox, so you dig it in, dig a hole, and it just fills the water. Mm -hmm. We were in the monsoon season there, I guess. So anyhow, get to the river. So the next morning, the second lieutenant, he, big deal, he taught this in OCS. He made a raft took some vine, tied it all together, and he selected myself and a guy in my squad with a Briton. I had a Tommy gun, Thompson submachine gun, and he had a Browning automatic rifle. So we had a half pack on it. We had it full of uh, ammunition and so forth. And uh, Brian did a kick out of that. Okay, you can continue here. It's, it's recorded. So anyhow, uh, so he told us to cross the river. So we get in that raft that he made, and the only place we went is straight down, sunk, right, just like a rock, you know. Well, we we nearly drowned because you could swim, you could see the light up there, but you couldn't get high enough. So you had to shed your pack and drop your ammunition and everything, you know. Finally, I got up to the top. 
and uh, swam out of there, and this lieutenant there was looking, and what I did, I took all my clothes off, set my shorts, and the lieutenant was there, and he had that 45 strapped to him. I reached over there, and I took that off, and I put it on, and I said, you stupid son of a bitch, that's what I call him. <laughs> 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 so anyhow, I swam the river, and I mentioned about those five dead Japs. In the morning, we couldn't find them, didn't know where they went. So I, I swam in that river, and there were three big crocodiles up the river there. I bet you they were 12 foot long. They'd open their great big mouth like that and shut it. But what happened, put two and two together, that's what happened to the Japs were laying there. They come at night and took them. The crocs took them. And, uh, but see, I, this is right where by the ocean, and I guess the crocodiles, they're freshwater fish, I guess you want to call it. And I was right by the ocean where it's salt water, you know, and I got halfway across there and I looked and holy Christ, I see them. One guy said later he looked like a motorboat. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as I got across, right there lay the dead jack, and he had the bugs all over and the flag, he draped with a flag. And this is where I was wrong. A lot of times they leave souvenirs or booby trap them, you know. Well, I never thought anything about that. I took the flag here and I shook the bugs off and I rinsed in the water and I held it up to the guy that crossed the shore. <laughs> then I walked around the way and it must have looked stupid. I had a, just my shorts on with a 45, walking a across the river in enemy territory. <laughs> We're waving a big red flag with a red bullseye right in the middle, right? <laughs> so anyhow, I went around there a little ways and in a shrubbery there, there was a boat with rope in it. So I paddled down a river and went across the river and everybody crossed the river in the boat. Well, that's how they got across, you know. But I bet you if there's any of the enemy there, if they see me, they must have thought I was crazy because <laughs> probably that pistol wouldn't even fire if I had to fire it. <laughs> well, that's the story of this play, so I still got it. <laughs> what, what do you think the writing, what, what's the writing on it, bud? Just... Oh, I was going to, uh, unit, what they do when they have a unit, they all sign the flag. Now that Japanese signature, if you can, there's a name of every person in the unit there. Oh, okay. And wow. they all write it in what, like Indian ink on the flag, and that was their flag with all the names on there. And I had a person read this, and they could, they said the, by the writing, I don't know how this woman could tell, just by the writing, that was a, what you might call elite unit, because of the, they could tell how they wrote. I don't know anything about that. So, so that's all these signatures. Just like you sign your name on a document or something, just for it's it's all you they, they, they did that, you know. Yeah. 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 Can you just hold that up again one more time, just so we can get that on the camera? Can you hold it up, bud? Let's get a good, let's get a nice shot of that. That is really really awesome. Here we go. I said the the, the flag with the the unit. You don't know what unit. You don't know what unit that came no, from. No, I have no idea. Okay. That is amazing. So I don't know how that, oh, here's the way it hangs. That way. <laughs> but it's kind of beat up. <laughs> so, great. Um, you may want to move on from there, but yeah. you've got a lot of questions to answer. Um, out of all your landings, does one stand out? Like, does, do you remember one landing more than, like, the others? No, I know Petaloo was a, Last one I was on, uh, what happened there aboard ship, this fellow is a Sergeant Thompson, he was. He was from New York City, so we were pretty good friends. And he said to me, Buddy, he said, uh, tomorrow morning we're going to land. He said, if anything happens to you or happens to me, we'll keep you the name of our folks back home and whoever. One of us get killed, the other one to go see the family. So, well, he got killed. And he was awarded the Silver Star besides. So when I got out of the service, 
I went straight to New York City to see his father. And he won't know how his son died. He won't ask a lot of questions. And I was there with him, you know, so he was uh, real interested. So later, oh heck, I was out of service and we were married. He got a letter from this Thompson, New York City. They are bringing a body home and he wanted me to be a pallbearer down in Long Island. So Betty and I went to the field to New York City there, or Long Island, for was a burial ceremony. It was quite, how to put it, uh, something different. <laughs> It's one of those memories you remember. It was, I'm sure, a touching moment, but you know, uh -huh. to be there. I'm sure it was a very touching moment to be there for it the was, family. It was, yeah, yeah. So. Um, like, uh, I saw you had two Purple Hearts um, for your wounds. So, um, where did you get wounded in on your body? Where did you get wounded at? The first time I got shot in the face, you wouldn't know it now. I took out a couple of teeth. Ooh. But that... In my opinion, what they call a spent bullet. I think it went through a tree or something mm -hmm. before, before it hit me, you know. And I, but I know we had another fellow, uh, he was, must have been calling out orders or something, and he got shot through here. The bullet went in here and right out this side, you know. He had his mouth open and it just, he must have been hollering or something. <laughs> so those things happen. I had a fellow in my squad, he was from Ithaca. He, he used to do what they call a scout. He'd go maybe ahead. He was shot once uh, right in the shoulder. And that bullet went right through here and out his back. It never hit a bone or a thing. So the second time, all he did was band-aid each side, more or less. So the second time, he got shot right through the stomach and out his back. They took him to the hospital and they uh, uh, not, didn't hurt a thing inside at all. But they cut a, he had a big scar here where they opened him up, but it didn't hurt intestines or nothing. It went right through his stomach and out his back. Now that's twice. He was shot twice. And it went, both bullets went through his body and... Uh, Really never hurt him, except what well, hurt a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, it hurt a lot. <laughs> then I had another guy in my squad. Uh, he was shot through the eye, he came out of the back of his head. Well, we marked, as he lay on the ground there, we just marked him. We didn't check pulse or anything. We just marked him and we took the ammunition, we left his dog tag there, and a corpsman, they come behind and pick up the body. So when I come back from overseas in California, this fellow, who should I see to walk down the gangplank? Him. And he had all plastic surgery here and so forth, and he said that he, uh, God, I said, I thought you were dead years ago. <laughs> he said he don't remember a thing, and six months later he woke up in a hospital in, Cal or in Australia. He was completely unconscious for that length of time. And he seemed good, everything except that eye was gone. You could, and the, you know, the, but that was it. And here, six months later, he come to. Now, that was amazing story. It's not a story, but. <laughs> <laughs> How about your second one, Bud? When did you get wounded the second time? In the knee. You know where your knee is, where the cord is there? And shot right through there. And the uh, doctor said, Quarter inch more would took all the nerves out of there and you'd have been crippled. What island was that on? Huh? What island was that on? That was Peleliu. That was on Peleliu too? Yeah. Mm. How they, did they, if I can benefit, how did they, what did they do for you then? But did you go to a field hospital or did they just patch up and send you right back into duty? Well, we didn't have field hospital. We was in invasion, you'd have nothing there. Took me on a, carried me out on a stretcher and I know him. What, well, what had happened, it, you got two bones in your leg, broke one, not the other. Could I? So they carried me on a stretcher, and the worst part of that was, Christ, that coral rock and stuff, they carried me on a stretcher, and the Japs opened fire, and these guys dropped the stretcher, all got under cover, 
Christ, I thought I broke my back when they dropped it, you know. So they took me down on a beach and then they put me in a little boat. They had like these wire stretchers. There's a hospital ship out in the bay. So they come in there with a boat and then on the hospital ship they like a boom. Reach down and pick up the stretcher and bring it on deck, you know. So I go in the hospital there and I, they give me, a, I think the thing is sodium pentothal. Boy, that puts you out quick. I know if you ever heard of that or not. Because mm -hmm. I know the doctor said, count to ten. Uh, all I remember, I got to six and he kept saying louder and that's the last I remember. So I woke <laughs> up and had a cast and everything on with pins and so forth and you know. <laughs> So I was interested. <laughs> um, once you guys would establish a beachhead, what, what would you and your squad do once the beachhead was already established? What would we do? Yeah. Huh? When the beachhead was established, what would you guys do? Well, we kept moving further inland. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, and like, um, like with the food, what type of food would you guys eat? Huh? What type of food would you guys eat, like, in, on an island? Oh, <clears throat> first, this is, we have what they call sea ration. Come in tin cans. Mm -hmm. Then later they come with what they call K ration. That was a little bit different. That was, well, packaged like dried milk and, I don't know, like cereal or something. It was all in a... Dried, everything was dried up, you'd soak up in water and stuff. Yeah. And they always had a, I don't know what this is for, like a candy bar, about yay long, about this thick. That was for, uh, I guess a lot of vitamins, and if you had to, I guess you could survive on it, just that candy bar. It wasn't really a, well, I call it a candy bar, but it was chocolate, but it had all this stuff. It didn't, it didn't taste too bad. But those uh, ration stuff is, uh, when we don't go out of canal, we didn't, while the, they had a, what they call, I guess, the iron bottom cell where all our ships were being sunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, for t two weeks or so, no supplies come in. We didn't have food or nothing. To, and there were little, where the Japs were, they had little, uh, Oh, like little tents where they had like a food supply there and stuff. So one thing they had was, uh, oh, I don't know if you call it, it's not condensed milk, it, it's thick. It's, uh, it's, it comes from Sweden, I know it's on a can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was sweet, but it was just come in little cans about yay big. This is, you can still buy that, similar to that in the store. It's not condensed milk, it's uh, powdered milk? Huh? No, I don't know, but I don't, I don't know if there, I know condensed milk, but I don't know if there's something. Oh, there's another kind. Uh, it's thick. It was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, let's see. Uh, like, while you are in the Pacific, did you know what was going on, going on in Europe, in the European campaign? Not much. Not no. much? How about back home? What was going? Did you know what was going on back home in the states? Oh, I used to get a paper every now and then, give you an idea. I didn't know. We didn't have time to read the paper enough, but we used to get one now and then. Did you guys, did you guys listen to the Armed Forces Radio? No, no. they didn't have that then. No. Um, in <clears> fact, we never. I don't remember ever listening to radio. Um. Do you, th uh, what are your th do you think that the uh, use of the atomic bomb to end the war, do you think that uh, that was justified because it would spare the U.S. I, I think so. Yeah. Um, is there the truth, we had no use for the jet because we seen what happened to some of our men. They tie them in a tree and use them for bayonet practice to kill them. We've seen that off and on. And well, they would still be alive, and they would they yeah. would cap somebody captured. They would do that, but huh? the, 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 they would still be alive, and then they would use them as bayonet as for bayonet practice. 
the, well, they killed them by using them for bayonet practice. That's how they okay, killed them. Okay, so I'm saying they were still alive when they tied them to the tree. Oh, yeah, they're tied. They're alive. Then they use them for bayonet practice. And as far as they go, I have no use for them now. I never will. <laughs> I just, yeah. I. One thing we was lucky though in the Pacific, better than it was in uh, Europe in a way. We knew what the enemy looked like. Short, and what we used to call them the slant-eyed bastards. <laughs> but, uh, but in Europe, you know, a lot of people looked like you and I, so they could change their uniform, and you never know if they were. And I guess they did that to them over there. Some of them would speak perfect English and stuff, and you think they're one of yours, and to find out they're mm -hmm. they're uh, German. Mm -hmm. um. When did you hear that uh, Japan had surrendered? Well, what happened uh, to me was uh, there were orders come through that anybody had been overseas in combat two years or wounded twice had come home. Mm -hmm. And I had it made both ways. So I came home. I went to Chronicle, Virginia, and there's a coach on a rifle range. From there, I was sent back to California to go back overseas the second time. And what happened was uh, I had malaria a lot. In California, I'd be on the list to go, and I had malaria, and then I'd be off the list. On the list and off the list. And then, because uh, that malaria seemed to recur continuous. And then uh, the war ended when I was in California. So I was happy I didn't have to go back a second time, because it's eight, three times and out, you know. <laughs> Speak of malaria. Um when you were on the island, did you encounter like a lot of diseases, like on the islands? Well, Mainly malaria. That was the only thing. And what would that do to the men? I'm not really familiar with what malaria does. Well, you get chills and a fever. You can't can't keep warm, yeah. and you lose a lot of weight too. Run a high temperature. I got a letter here. I wrote home. I. Malaria, I got, I can believe this or not, and temperature 106 degrees. <laughs> how, how would you guys, like, um, fight it while you guys were, like, on the islands, like on Peleliu or Guadalcanal? Like, they fight the malaria? Yeah, fight the malaria. They give us what they call Adabrin, a little yellow tablet. Mm -hmm. Then later they come out with quinine, I think it was. But that Adabrin, Oh, that was bitter. Great. You could swallow that, make you almost throw up. But then, uh, would have got so, you get in formation, and the uh, drill sergeant there would go right to you, and you open your mouth, he throws it in there. <laughs> and there's no way you could keep that in your mouth long. You could spit it out in front of them, and by that time, it dissolved. Holy. Right. Well, that's how we got out of right now. And you turn yellow on that. It looks like you got jaundice. Mm. So. Um, what um, did you uh, on VJ Day? Did you did you celebrate any on VJ Day? No. All I did is well, nothing. I just glad it was over. <laughs> well, yeah. I was in. California, there was a, we didn't have no celebration. There's not not a big on the, on the base at all, but there was no, nothing on the base. Hmm. And uh, if you want like the medals over there, can you just like which ones did you earn? Like what medals did you earn over there? Well, actually, a lot of those are just there because I was in that area. It was war. The only thing I really got it was the two purple hearts. You might say earn, but. <laughs> But the rest of them just. What about the presidential citations? That was your. Well, that is as a unit. So as a unit, I think we got two of them. Presidential citations. Um, we got about 15 minutes left in battery time. Though. All right. No, much more left. Um, there are any memorable events, like during the war, that you wanted to talk about? Uh, no, no, there isn't much, I guess. Okay. And uh, when were you discharged? 
Huh? When were you discharged? November of 45, I think it's. Tell me here. November 10th? Um, where is it? Maybe on the front. November 1945, it's the 6th, 6th of November. If, if I can ask, if, if I can interject, but between when the Japanese surrendered in August and November, what did you do for those months, bud? Why was there the delay in getting out? <clears throat> really nothing. We was in, on, we was in camp, was it Camp Pendleton when that happened? <clears throat> What we did, we just on base had have some troop and drill, and uh, there was one in California there when uh, I, what I had uh, detail like on Saturday morning, they have Liberty, it starts at noon, so I had a group there and we cleaned the toilets and get everything ship shape and we didn't have stand inspection because you had to stand inspection if they found anything wrong you were restricted you know so we didn't have stand inspection but we had one fellow I had him cleaning toilets private in the Marine Corps and I didn't pay much attention but on Liberty he, this guy goes out and he gets a new brand new Plymouth I remember that <laughs> drives away and I said to the guy how the hell can he he uh, afford a car like that, being only a private in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Well, you know who that is? And I said, no, I don't know who he is. He's the guy who had clean toilets. <laughs> <laughs> that was Robert Ryan. Did you ever hear him as a movie actor? <laughs> uh, Big. Yeah. <laughs> he was cleaning things. Never, you never know that he was a movie actor or nothing. He just <laughs> did what he was told and that was it. <laughs> That's interesting. See, there, there's a, there's a, there's a moment right there. <laughs> there, that's a moment right there. That's interesting story. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, well, it surprised me. I, but I then later after the out of service, he movies he was in. And I, thing is, then he had I got I got you call pock marks in his face. And I don't know what they are. You know, I think they get. You know what I'm talking about? Like from acne or something like little that. Little black. Yeah, I know. But on a movie, it wasn't actually. You never know it there. They used uh, makeup and so forth. But he was a good actor, everybody said. I thought he was too. But he, he, in the Marine Corps, he was, he was just a Marine. Did as he done it. Never showed any uh, rank or, you know, that he, that he was, uh, had money or anything. You never know that. Um, after the war, uh, what did you do as far as like education or a career? I didn't go uh, take any education. I just graduated from RFA and that mm. was it. What about for like a career? Did you have any certain career or anything? What? Like a career after the war? Did you have any? Oh, let's see. I worked in a mill. Then later, I bought a farm where I live now and I farmed it. And uh, this is. Not really a story, but I just a real mail carrier, you know, and I kept saying uh, to my wife, boy, I'd like to get that job. If there's a vacancy, I'm going to apply for it. What they had then, anybody lived on a mail room, and there was a vacancy, they'd have a civil service exam. So finally there was a vacancy, a little ad in the paper, not much. And I went over to the post office and got an application and filled it out. I went to Utica. One of the high schools in the Utica that took the civil service exam. Mm -hmm. That exam was a lot different than I think it is now. There were, I think, a hundred questions, or was there two hundred? A hundred, anyway. You'd get fifty of them, you had a time limit. And then uh, at lunch break, and you get the rest of the questions, you had a time limit on that, too. So I'm there in a room, and I'm the last one. Every time uh, everybody be out there, and I kept looking over and see if I had things right. So uh, I said to the fellows after the lunch break, I said, Jesus, a lot of those questions, uh, they'd have, uh, they'd ask a question and they have four places, check which one match, and then there'd be another place would be none of the above apply, because they'd be like figuring dollars and cents. 
I said, the guy, gee, I found quite a few. And they said, oh, I didn't find any. I said, I see quite a few like that. What happened, they'd say, like, it broke down in stage, you know. Uh, uh, partial poles to cost and everything, it'd be, maybe it'd be like a dollar fifty, you know, that might be the answer, so everybody checked that dollar fifty. Well, what I figured out, it never come out that way, but I'd check none of the above apply. Well, the trick was reading. That was to see if you read that completely. Well, a lot of fellows would look, when they, as soon as they found that, when they'd figure it out to a certain point, say they come up with a dollar and a half, that's the one they'd check. But if you read it in detail, you had to carry it out further. Uh, so I got home, and uh, well, this went on for quite a while, and I, I was supervisor in the town of Lee then, and at that time, supervisor was supervisor and county legislator. Both were in one. Mm -hmm. So I down to Utica to board me, and my wife called up and said, and passing, by the way, was 70. So my wife called up, we got a letter from the Civil Service Commission, uh, might be the result of the test. Can I open it? I said, no, wait till I get home. I didn't want her to see, oh man, I failed. <laughs> <laughs> so I get home, and I open the letter, and she's right there, I said, get out of here. I, I, I wanted to see the price, and I looked at it, and I said, oh shit, I got 90, or I got 69. My wife's face got that long. But I reversed the figures. He said, you received 96, you were first on the list, eligible, you know. But the thing is, like I said, those questions were tricky. Mm -hmm. And I think the main point of that wasn't figuring out so much, is to read the question yeah. and find out what they had there didn't match, so you checked down to the bubble pie. Okay, then we've got about five minutes left of time. So anyhow, I carried mail for 20 years and retired. <laughs> That's the end of the story. <laughs> uh, well, if any of the pictures or anything, Mr. Well, why don't we maybe zoom up on Git, like Bud will have, hold up your things and I'll zoom in on them. Ben, if you want to grab them, why don't you grab like his model and we'll get that recorded, Bud. And then if you have any, any final comments you want to say. There's the two purple hearts. Okay. Um, we want to get some of the pictures. Why don't we get there's that young picture of you in there, bud? Huh? That young picture. There's a picture of you when you're when you're young. Right on the bottom. Here. Here. Get that one, bud. Okay. When was there. that taken, Mr. Payne? This picture right here. When? Yeah, when? I don't know. In the forties sometime. All right. You know, I, and if we really could, because we're on this, why don't we get one of that flag again, Bud? Because that is just truly awesome, that flag. Want me to hold up, Mr. Painter? Huh? Want me to hold it up? Or? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay. This, this. Okay, let me let me get, zoom out a little bit. Okay. That is truly awesome. All righty. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, let's get that one too. We've got to get to Marie Corps. <laughs> okay. okay, you procured, you procured that from the Legion, right, bud? Got to pull it down just a little bit. There you go. Very good. Okay. This this picture here. Turn turn it around, but so we can all zoom in on it. Huh? Turn that picture around so I can get a good photo of it. Okay. All right. What was that picture? You know what that was? When the Legion had their uh, uh, anniversary a couple of years ago. Right. And I, they asked me to say something, so this is where I'm talking. And then for everybody to see it, it's quite remarkable that after all these years, uh, Mr. Payne's still in his Marine Corps uniform. <laughs> so that's quite amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're all done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you bud. You got everything then, huh? Yeah. We'll make some copies here, if you don't mind, of your, your discharge and stuff like that, and definitely of that, that uh, poem, that the poem there, the one about being in the, the, the foxhole there. That's a great one. I want, I want to keep a copy of that myself. So. Well, I don't know. Like, 
that take. I, I kept.